Hi everyone, this is Fiona Apollo, and I do art commentary. Welcome, welcome, how are you all doing? So if you're an artist watching this, has anyone ever said to you that you have an art style that reminds them of XYZ, or that you have an XYZ art style? Maybe you got hit with the old, is that anime chestnut back in school? This can be anything from saying that your style looks like it should be a real TV show, comparing it to an archetype or some kind of hallmark, or even something completely ridiculous like saying you have the art style of an SJW, or even a criminal. Yeah, I've had both of those crop up, and to no one's surprise, both times were on TikTok, because of course they were. TikTok is a cesspool. At first I was really confused, obviously. Like, how do you come to that kind of conclusion when looking at someone's art style? But then I started thinking about it and how this kind of perspective shapes how certain pieces of media are both produced and received by audiences. It also opens up a bit of a conversation about whether you really can gauge such things through a person's styling. Is this person just really good at drawing feet or is something else happening here? <laughs> I won't judge, I won't judge, I'm just curious. So today I wanted to talk about art style associations and art style biases. We've touched on this a few times before on this channel, for example when talking about about adult cartoons, it was brought up a few times that they all have this distinctive ugly styling that is apparently supposed to signal to parents that children shouldn't be watching, even though we all know most parents don't care. But hey, that's none of my business, I'm not a parent. But if I was. We also have other forms of this kind of bias being used, such as the infamous Cal art style being a shorthand for why every western kids cartoon looks the same nowadays, which I'm quite interested to dig into because it's quite an interesting one. The term itself is wholly inaccurate and I really want to get into that. We also have things like the Disney style being perceived as this kid-friendly, sanitised depiction of the world, and then we have the Tumblr art style which is sometimes conflated with the Cal art style with the bean mouth and everything, but there is a bit of a difference between the two, so again we're gonna get into it. If this kind of thing tickles your fancy then then keep on watching, and if you like what you're hearing, please be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Are there any prominent art styles you think are worth talking about? Also, for curiosity's sake, what kind of art style do you guys think I have? Looking at your own work, it feels a bit hard to pin down how other people see it and what kind of influences went into it, so let me know down below and I'll try to let you know if you're correct or not. Anyway, enough gibbering, let's begin. Part 1. The Origins of Style Art style bias is pretty much what it says on the tin, it's when someone looks at a particular art style and immediately passes judgement on the aesthetics first before anything else. This can be as benign as seeing a really cartoony art style for a TV show and assuming that it will be a fun, light-hearted series, and most of the time you wouldn't be wrong, unless it's like Happy Tree Friends or something. But like we mentioned in the intro, depending on which person is looking and what opinions they have about certain media, these presumptions can have a bit more of a sinister undertone, or at the very least a bit more of a pessimistic one. I should also mention that an art style can often encompass the subject matter they choose to focus on as well as the aesthetics, so it doesn't always just pertain to visual presentation. But where do these specific styles originate from, and what causes them to morph and change in the way that they do? To start us off, let's look into how certain styles become associated with specific mediums and types of stories on a more corporate level, and then in the next section we'll go into how this can feed into an art style bias that affects individuals. In the most basic terms, art styles on a collective or corporate scale evolve to reflect the media they are used in the most. There's a reason a lot of comic books, indie games, or anime look the same, and when it comes to something like a studio working together to create a product, I believe it comes down to three prominent factors – efficiency, who is working on it, and budget. When you're working on a serialised product that has a lot of moving parts working together, unless you have already planned and budgeted for a different art direction, it's often much easier on everyone to go along with an art style that is similar to what your team members are already accustomed to. That's not to say that these people can't do other things, we all know that's not true, but things like muscle memory can play a big part in how quickly someone can finish a piece, and in a professional setting this can become crucial, especially right now. Revisions can be costly to holding up a production, so the simpler the style and more familiar the crew already are with it from other projects, the better. For example, in TV animation, if you asked someone who primarily worked on shows with simplified art styles like Steven Universe or Adventure Time to work on something more aligned with Jojo, sure they might be able to do it, they're professionals, it's their job, but there will often be that adjustment period which sometimes can't really be accommodated for if the production is on a tight schedule. This can also be said for mediums such as comic book styles. Originally in print, it was easier to use pure black to shade and give definition to an image because using colour was expensive, and even as colour was slowly introduced, this method persisted even as printing both in colour and black and white levelled out, and is now viewed as a stylistic choice that defines the medium even though it originated from the necessity to economise on materials. The typical comic book style is also easier to replicate on singular still panels as opposed to something like animation that can require 24 drawings just for a single second. A lot of archetypal art styles you see for different mediums are often born out of what is most convenient while still giving the best visual results. The issue of budget also heavily plays into this, just like with printing comics back 
in the day, there's a reason genres like animated sitcoms especially have such limited stylization with no shading or detailing for the same reason they rely on dialogue scenes while cycling through a handful of movements. It's just a lot cheaper, especially when it's not exactly a secret, people don't really watch those types of shows for the aesthetics. With regards to this, and this is an obvious one, but another aspect that comes into these art styles is that having them all be of a similar vein helps to indicate what kind of show it will be. We already touched on adult cartoons being used as indicators that kids shouldn't be watching, but it's also prominent in how kids' shows have bright colours to stimulate a child's brain and utilise short, stubby characters that are more in line with a toddler or young child's proportions. It even applies in anime, which is typically popular with adolescents, and has a large focus on teenage characters that toe the line between more realistic proportions and movements, while still having large eyes, oftentimes bright or contrasting colour palettes, and unique hairstyles. These kinds of choices appeal to a demographic who are both finding their identity, and they normally express that in how they choose to dress and present themselves physically, and also who are crossing that threshold into adulthood and wanting to be treated more maturely. Also, before we start getting into the whole discussion about styles such as cal arts, I just want to mention that a lot of anime also have the bright colour schemes and things that shows such as Dead End Paranormal Park are slammed for, but because the stylization is more detailed, having some shading and additional intricacies in there makes it marginally less obvious. Just wanted to throw that in there because it's interesting to me how elements of a style are received when it's not being complemented by other specific elements. So overall, art styles can be pretty self-explanatory in the sense that they give you the initial idea of what to expect from their respective material, and a lot of the time, the hallmarks of these styles are derived from whatever method gets the best visual results in the cheapest way possible. It's really not rocket science when you break it down, this is how pretty much anything in the world grows and evolves, and art is no exception. But what happens when these styles start to get attributed to individuals? What can be the consequences of this? Part 2. The Cal Arts Legacy so now that we have a bit of background on why these specific styles develop and become associated with certain mediums and genres, how does this end up affecting how individuals are perceived and how does that feed into other people's biases? To figure this out, I had a particular situation in mind, but I wanted to gather people's thoughts on the topic in general before expanding it. So I went and vaguely asked people what they thought of the Cal Arts or Tumblr art styles. And while I didn't anticipate around, what, 140 responses? That is crazy to me, but honestly, it seems to keep happening lately. There's a reason I keep using the term cal art style, even though it's inaccurate, and man, did people get riled up about it from both sides. People either hate the term and don't especially care for the kind of art style it refers to, or they hate the fact that this has become a blanket term used to refer to cartoons by people who aren't even affiliated with cal arts in any way. For anyone who isn't in the know about this, there is a specific school that many aspiring industry professionals flock to in the states called the California Institute of the Arts, known more commonly as cal arts. This school was opened in 1961 and was staffed by a wide array of highly respected people in the industry, including one guy, you may have heard of him, I don't know, he goes by the name of uh, Walt Disney. Yeah, the school is very closely tied to animation because of this affiliation, and it also boasts some of the highest numbers of alumni relating to a particular industry in the entire world, including the likes of John Lasseter, Tim Burton, Brad Bird, and Henry Selick, all relating to animation specifically. Safe to say, it's a very reputable school, and because so much of the animation industry is located in California, a substantial number of people tend to go from attending the school to securing a job there, which is why it's so competitive. In TV animation especially, you can see that quite a few graduates from CalArts get the chance to create their own shows, including those who supposedly perpetuate the now infamous CalArts style, such as Adventure Time's Pendleton Ward, Gravity Falls' Alex Hirsch, Over the Garden Wall's Pat McHale, and Star vs. the Forces of Evil's Darren Nefsi. That said, not everyone likes the style, and that's fine, it's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but there are also those who view it as a mark on the world of animation animation, as well as an obstacle towards creating shows that stand out visually. When I put out my posts, I included this gif, which was actually made by the creator of Ren and Stimpy, John Crickfalusi? Crickfalusi? Is that how you say it? We'll just call him John. John absolutely hates this art style and is also the one who coined the cal art style as a term in the first place. So let's chat about it for a second, because I believe that this is a brilliant example of negative art style bias. Firstly, the cal art style typically refers to specific character designs in cartoons originating from the likes of channels such as Cartoon Network and Disney Channel. It's pretty much become this derogatory shorthand for any cartoon where the characters have stubby proportions, big eyes, rounded shape language, and most infamously, a big grin that takes up half the face known as the bean mouth. 
and it's important to recognize that this style rose to prominence because of a shift in the industry, not because of the schools these animators come from. Now, I think we can all kind of understand where John is coming from with regards to how a lot of these shows look very similar and how it can feel like if you are going against that grain, your project may suffer for it. But taking into account what we mentioned in the previous section, this stylization is more so just a natural evolution into what was both appealing to the target demographic of the time, as well as what is easier and more efficient for the crews working on them to produce. But what also bothers people about this term is that a lot of other cartoons associated with this style are by people who never even attended CalArts. Shows like Steven Universe and The Amazing World of Gumball are both seen as prime examples of the CalArts style, but Rebecca Sugar attended school in New York, and Ben Beauclay lives and works in the UK. The impression that this art style is being derived from an institution with such a competitive culture around it is kind of understandable since there can be a perceived sense of elitism from these types of places, but to try and pin that on individuals whose works just happen to look familiar but are outstanding in many other ways, and to even go so far as to morph the faces of these characters slightly to make them look even more similar in your gif to further your own point is kind of misleading. Something that also popped up when people critique the Cal art style is that people love to bring up how diverse cartoons looked back in the 90s, and to their credit, 90s cartoons were great for that. But what people fail to recognise with this argument is that styles are kind of like trends, they fall in and out of fashion constantly. Okay, back in the 90s, cartoons looked very different to one another. I wonder what spawned that? Why don't we go back another decade and look at the 80s? Oh yeah, most cartoons were only made to sell toys back then, and most of the toys were manufactured using the same character moulds, which in turn meant that the characters from multiple different cartoons would all look exactly the same, but with a change of outfit or colour palette. Like I said, these things go in circles. And it's not just Cal Arts that get all the flack, we also see this kind of argument happen with the Tumblr art style as well. This one is often characterised as being one with specific social leanings, and is also referred to as the SJW art style. Oftentimes the focus of the Tumblr art style is less to do with visual appeal, even though that is still important, and is actually more to do with subject matter. It tends to include things such as stretch marks, diverse skin tones and body shapes, fat rolls, scars, wonky noses, and other such things deemed as imperfections in an attempt to bring awareness and acceptance towards them. The style on a visual level also does have a few things that stand out, and which can cause it to be confused with the CalArts style, such as the use of diverse body shapes as we mentioned, uh, coloured noses was another thing, and heavy blush was one as well. The Tumblr art style is pretty interesting because it rose to prominence when Tumblr was at its peak, and came as this kind of rejection of current social standards of beauty and depictions of specific people and bodies within mainstream media. Also, the fact that Steven Universe was one of the ruling cartoons of this time most likely had a hand in the way it developed. I tend to view it as a very self-reflective art style, as this was the early to mid 2010s, a time when people were coming together on the platform, discovering more like-minded people similar to them, and were being more open about the more unsavoury feelings and experiences they had gone through. And many channeled these feelings into their art pieces, which were then viewed as a first step towards healing from them. This is also why vent art started to become such a widespread thing on the platform as well. The problem with that though is that, well, not everyone likes that, and they pushed back against it in any way they could. The easiest way for trolls and such to do this was to brand the art style as having some underlying political agenda, and bear in mind this was when there was a massive push for LGBT and POC representations in media, so the people partaking in the style would also then get riled up and push back at them, and the style just became more and more polarising because of the discourse enveloping it. While this seems to have calmed down a lot, these kinds of pushbacks still happen from time to time in other ways, especially on Twitter, and there will always be a different group of people who become the target for these kinds of accusations of pushing an agenda. For example, a few days ago I saw a tweet from someone who received DMs from a person accusing them of uh, appealing to a specific audience because they had a VTuber model that was flat chested, even though the character is of age and was meant to reflect how this person looked in real life, being a petite woman herself. And there isn't really a way to stop or minimise or prevent this at the moment, this is just kind of the nature of the internet and social perceptions right now. I'm not really making this video with the intention of finding a solution, it's just interesting to me to see how these kinds of things originate and develop, but I gotta say, it does sting to see people throw such brazen accusations around over a character design. Those kinds of things can ruin an innocent person's reputation and it can destroy their confidence and strive to continue making anything if everything they make is going to be accused of something sinister. I feel like I really shouldn't have to say this, but don't say that stuff unless you have proof, or at the least proof of them encouraging that kind of audience. Seriously, you can really mess someone up by accusing them of stuff like that, it's not fair. But anyway, that's all I have to say for this section, but I do have a few more points before we close this one out. Part 3. The Spider-Verse Effect 
Overall, I think like with a lot of other aspects of life, people just like to categorise things. It's a symptom of evolutionary survival that is now just manifesting in a different way with the modern age now that choosing between two things doesn't equal life or death. And while an art style can help gauge whether you like something on an aesthetic level, subtext can sometimes be completely unrelated, so it's often not very helpful to only judge things by appearances. Also, let's be honest, a lot of the argument surrounding it is kind of overblown. The cal art style is cute and it simplifies the animation process. It's not taking over the industry, nor is it born out of some weird sense of elitism from a particular school. That's stupid. But even with that said, there will always be art styles that people like more than others, and those styles can even go on to inspire other artists both individually and on a corporate level to follow in its footsteps. With that said, I want to end this video with an example of a positive art style association and bias. I feel like no other media property in recent recent years has had such a profound impact and caused a shakeup in how the animation medium is approached, especially in movies, quite like Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse, and I think a fair few people are going to agree with me on that. Now, something that we didn't touch on when it came to art styles is 2D versus 3D. 3D animation since about 2007 kind of went through a bit of a stagnation, and what I mean by that is that most animated films in particular had the same kind of character designs and rendering styles that hark back to films such as Disney's Tangled, which is not a bad film at all, and the films that adopted a similar style weren't all bad either, but visually speaking, there wasn't much variation aside from a couple of outliers such as Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Because 3D is still such a new medium, even though it has improved rapidly, 3D animation has only been around for just over 20 years, compared to over 100 years for 2D, so a lot of people are still finding their footing with it and trying to work around accessibility and budgeting issues. Proficiency in the medium is also kind of a big obstacle. 3D isn't like 2D, where you can just pick up a pencil and start animating even if you're not the greatest artist. The pipeline is a lot more technical and you also need to be able to understand first of all how computers work, second of all how textures work, physics work, particles, bones, and so much else before stylization can even be a factor. It's not so bad when you work with a crew on a big budget production, but that's still a lot to ask. 3D films for a long time were so focused on making the movements, textures, and everything else look very lifelike in order to display this sense of proficiency, and in my opinion may have also been an attempt to getting people to take the medium seriously, but we don't know that. In some ways this worked, but in the eyes of some viewers and animation fans, it just felt like there wasn't much point in all of these films being animated if they just wanted to go through the motions of making it look lifelike, and people started to become disinterested. But then when Spider-Verse came about and adopted both a comic book style and graffiti style approach to its visual it was exceptional and unlike anything else that was coming out at the time. And man, were people really happy about that because it broke out of this monotonous lifelike imitation by instead leaning into the strengths afforded by the animation medium. And since then, other films have seen the positive reception of this and also leaned into it in their own ways, which is why we now have films like The Bad Guys and Puss in Boots The Last Wish. Are these styles similar in efficiency or execution compared to the TV animated series art styles we discussed? Probably not, but the thing with these kinds of styles is that because there is such a big demand for them, this affords a bit more flexibility in certain aspects such as budget and deadline that would otherwise restrict these kinds of properties being made. Another fantastic example is Arcane. The level of artistry in Arcane is just kind of unmatched in TV animation at this moment in time. I think the only series I have seen with any kind of similarity is Love, Death and Robots, which is more so a compilation of short stories and not really a serialised narrative, though that being said actually, it's highly likely that the success of Love, Death and Robots may have inspired it. I don't know, I haven't really looked into it. But it's different, it's refreshing, and people love it and want to see more of it, which contributes to a positive bias towards this more experimental stylization. Or at the least, that's what we're experiencing currently, until there comes a time when every single property tries to copy this formula, and then people start to complain about every single show trying to differentiate itself too much. I have no idea whether that will actually happen, but at this point, nothing really surprises me. People are just never really satisfied. Anyway, I think that's where I'll stop for now. This stuff is honestly so fascinating, isn't it? God, I love this medium. Thank you so much for watching and if you like this video, please remember to like, comment, and subscribe. Are there any examples of positive or negative art style biases you can think of? Do you agree or disagree with me on certain points? Please let me know. I will admit it's been getting a bit more difficult lately to respond to comments, but I do try to at least read them all. I really love seeing some of the discussions that come about from these videos. I don't know, it just makes me happy. <laughs> anyway, stay safe everyone, and I will speak to you very soon. Bye!